All right, wonderful. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Uh, this is a meeting of the West Palm Beach City Commission. It is our Mayor Commission work session. Today is Tuesday, uh, November 13th, and uh, we're going to get started. First on our agenda is uh, a presentation by Discover the Palm Beaches. I'm happy to welcome Jorge Pasquera here. And uh, if you'll go to the podium. <clears throat> Welcome. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, uh, uh, Honorable Commission. Uh -huh. So before we start, Jorge and I just saw each other a few days ago at the opening of the Downton Abbey exhibit. And if you haven't gone yet, I highly recommend. I, I've never seen the show. I'm not, I'm not somebody who was addicted and watched it. But just going through the exhibit is fascinating. It's really excellent. It really is first class. It's a world-class um, exhibit. Uh, it's actually a better uh, layout from what I'm told by the organizers than they, what they had in New York because they had more space to play with, and I think uh, everybody should take a look. So Yeah, and, and, and as I said, there are a lot of mayors in other cities that are jealous of us right now because right. we got their second, um, after New York, the second uh, spot <coughs> in the U.S. to exhibit this. That's right. <coughs> so, uh, Mayor, again, thank you for the opportunity to share. Uh, some of our success here, um, we're full of good news here. Well, we say that we're in the good news business, uh, but more importantly, um, we, um, we're, we're here to plant a seed, if you will, for what we believe could be a historically noteworthy and important transformational opportunity for the city of West Palm Beach, and more on that in just a minute. So I'm hoping I'm clicking here in the right place. Okay. So first, the good news. We've had record uh, visitation, job creation, and economic impact over the past six years. You see the numbers. It's almost 8 million visitors, 70,000 tourism jobs, and over 7 billion in economic impact. Now, <clears throat> visitation over the last six years has increased 61%. That's a, more than 10% per year. It is outpacing the state of Florida by 28 points. We know that the state of Florida you know, likes to boast about record visitation, well, we've been outpacing them by a significant amount. And West Palm Beach has really played an important uh, role in our success. But quite frankly, we believe that the best is yet to come. And uh, why do visitors come here? Well, you have a lot of good, great assets here between City Place, the outlets, uh, Antique Road, the zoo, Clematis, and so on. But one thing that is not on this chart and something that we're going to do a lot more research about is the number of people who are coming to West Palm Beach because a meeting planner or a president of a company said, you're going to West Palm Beach to a convention, a meeting, or some kind of an event. West Palm Beach gets about 40% of all meetings, attendees, or visitors to Palm Beach County. So you can r realize that there's a significant opportunity right there. You know, we recently had an economic development study done was, as well. And um, they came up with the number of 59% of the visitors to Palm Beach County come to West Palm. So somewhere in around that, between 40 and 59. <laughs> yes. Well, um, and, I, and we shared a lot of our information with yes. the economic development study Thank folks. You. But there are some opportunities that I think we'll, we'll, I'll point out in a second. You have a great inventory of hotel rooms. It's been expanding since 2005, 36 properties, 4,400 rooms. You see the list here. Um, Boca is very close behind. It's almost only about 50 to 80 rooms behind West Palm Beach, so they have a significant inventory. And uh, you have a lot coming in the pipeline uh, with the 10 properties. You see them here. You know about them, the canopy, the autograph, and the others. But, but all of this is great stuff, but the size and the type of properties don't necessarily, and they're wonderful properties, don't get me wrong, uh, bode well for some of the major initiatives from the meetings and conventions market side that we're going to talk about in a, in a minute. So that's all good stuff. Now, this is one of the charts that I think we provided to the economic development folks, uh, the oh, that study. Was, that was it. Yes, yeah. 51%. So West Palm is getting the majority of the visitors, but in terms of overnight stays, actually right. Boca is somewhat ahead. Yeah. And that has to do with proximity to Miami, proximity to certain other things, a lot of corporate overnight business that is happening over there. So that's the kinds of things that I think this commission needs to think about. And what can we do in a collaborative way 
between the county and the city and the tourism development uh, agencies to address the overnight visitation into uh, West Palm Beach, which brings a lot of economic impact. So as I said, a transformational opportunity exists, and it has to do with groups. We've had a tremendous increase in group business over the last four years, 130 uh, percent overall in the county, but more importantly, since the arrival of the Hilton West Palm Beach, a 560 percent increase in um, convention attendees or room nights related to the convention center. That's only with a 400 room hotel connected to the convention center. So you have what we think of as a beautiful blank canvas to paint a beautiful masterpiece in the future because this is the convention campus and it is the kind of would be the envy of many other cities that don't have the kinds of space and opportunities to do things that are available here without having to tear down other buildings and uh, take over parts of streets or roads or what have you. Uh, so we believe that West Palm Beach can truly become a meetings powerhouse uh, and that is our message. We have uh, no doubt that increasing the capacity of the convention center, expanding the Hilton and West Palm Beach here and getting another headquarter hotel in the vicinity walkable or even connected to the convention center is critically important and could really bode so well to put West Palm Beach on the map in the meetings and conventions uh, market. So this is kind of the campus from a high level point of view. The real campus is truly the area around the convention center. It is that, that couple of blocks between Parker and Dixie that really convention planners and convention organizers are looking for to make their decisions. They're not, they're, we're competing with the world, we're competing with the San Antonios of the world and the Minneapolis and we'll see a couple of examples later on. But connectivity, walkability and uh, the ease of moving their attendees and delegates around is critically important. So you have, we see this and you know there may be debates about this, a lot of different potential convention hotel sites. For us the, the most um, logical and we've had some conversations with the team here is right on top of the convention center or to the side of the convention center next to uh, Howard Park because you already have the West Palm Beach Hilton and the opportunity to expand that in the future but the, 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 the creation of this campus is really what we are looking to do over the long term 10, 15 years down the so line. So you're talking about a hotel in addition to um, a second Hilton. Correct. Okay. Absolutely. And that is, in our opinion, absolutely fundamental for the long term competitiveness of West Palm Beach as a meetings and convention destination. So the rationale for us is kind of evident. We have, as we're standing here today, turned away or lost 678,000 room nights, which is about a half a billion dollars in business. And that is because of a mostly half of the reason is for a combination of lack of hotel inventory or lack of the right configuration of the convention center. Whether it's a, not enough exhibit space, not enough ballroom space, not enough breakout space, that is the, uh, the rationale or the reason for these lost room nights. So your own economic development study has pointed out the need for additional rooms. The TDC board in their discussions has said it's a no-brainer. And uh, we have our own customer advisory board, and I know Chris Rook has been part of that in a couple of times, we're saying it's, it's absolutely evident to us that if you build it, we will come. So what this could do is spur another billion dollars in development opportunities down the line by increasing the capacity. Right now we're really hosting conventions of 500 to 1,000 attendees and that's pushing the outer limits when in September, October there's no, no, nobody coming to South Florida. Um, but we're like to double or even triple that in the future and the opportunity definitely is there. This would align with the sales strategies of the Business Development Board and the own economic development objectives of the City of West Palm Beach. I know that you're targeting financial services, uh, fine maritime, uh, antiques, what have you. Bringing people aligned with those types of uh, meetings uh, to showcase the city was going to tell people in Milwaukee and Chicago and other places, why is my company not here in such a beautiful location? 
And of course, this will help uh, the airport as well as generate additional tax revenues. Here's a couple of examples. Uh, we just had a, a wonderful uh, tourism event uh, just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, this is Indianapolis. They have expanded their, their convention center five times, and they've expanded their inventory of connected hotels to 12, and they are now considered the number one convention city in the country. This is Avenida Houston. Houston has got the largest convention center, and they've now just completed a couple of 1,200 room hotels on either side of this convention facility in Houston, and they're really making a big jump in this marketplace. You've all seen probably the news about the Miami Convention Center just completed a 260,000 square foot expansion. They just approved last week an 800 room headquarter hotel, and they're moving quickly in the direction of expanding the Miami Beach and Miami downtown uh, uh, availability of convention uh, facilities. Excuse me, Jorge, sure. we have a question. Commissioner Lambert. Sure. Thank you. I just had a clarification. What's yep. a headquarter hotel? A headquarter hotel is the, head, is the hotel that the meeting organizer, the meeting planner, uses as the base of operation for their delegations. Okay. So they, they, they always have to have one hotel where it is listed, or two or three, oh. depending on what have, that is listed on the convention information as this is the hotels we have contracted with because convention organizers need to contract a block of rooms way in advance so that those rooms would be available for the convention to, uh, to happen in that location. So the Hilton West Palm Beach may give us three years down the line 250, 300 rooms uh, there, and there, that's the limitations that we're facing right now in terms of the, the type and the size of conventions that we're hosting here. Does that answer the question? Sure, but what size is a typical headquarter? I guess it depends on the size of the... Well, conference. I mean, it's all over the place. I mean, if you go to uh, uh, Orlando, which is probably the first or second, depending on how you count, uh, uh, convention destination in the country, they have room uh, hotels of 1,500 rooms, 1,200 rooms. Las Vegas has hotels of 3,000 rooms, 2,500 rooms, the Venetian, the MGM, and so forth, that are almost self-contained cities and convention facilities. So th that's kind of the range. but. We believe that if with the expansion of the Hilton West Palm Beach in the future, we hope, and and the second headquarter hotel, we can amass about a 1,200 to 1,500 room campus of hotel rooms that can host conventions that would have 2,000 to 2,500 delegates at a time, whereas right now we're bringing 500 to 1,000 delegates at any one time. Broward just uh, has announced a 800 room hotel. They are kind of taking it slowly. There have been changes in the, uh, in the configuration, but a 75% increase in exhibit space, and they are just down the street, and a fierce competitor of ours. And Tampa, more Florida destinations are betting on the convention market. Tampa has got a three-year, 30 million capital improvement plan, and the owner of the Jacksonville Jaguars has announced that he is privately, together with the city, uh, uh, developing a hotel and exhibit facility. So everybody's jumping in this, but we are convinced, based on what customers are telling us, this is not us making this up, that we have a unique opportunity to really capture the imagination of the meeting planning world. So our call to action to the City Commission is to further integrate tourism and meetings and conventions into your economic development strategy. Support the future. We're going to go out on an RFP pretty soon through the TDC for a convention center future and expansion study. We hope that that will provide additional rationale for collaboration between the city and the county on the expansion of the convention center and additional room inventory and align the city with what would be the future tourism master plan, uh, the master plan for tourism development that would be a county-wide roadmap to grow the tourism industry in Palm Beach County. And with that, I'm done and I'm open to questions. Thank you. I, you know, I was talking with the related folks over the weekend, and they're ready to go with that second hotel. Maybe you can help the county help that move along. Absolutely. We, we would, uh, we're going to be engaging with uh, the TDC executive director and having some discussions. Um, our senior VP of Destination Development is here, Don Kolos, who has been very involved in uh, the development of the RFP for the expansion uh, uh, of the convention center. So that's absolutely, if those discussions have been taking place in West Palm Beach, we'd certainly entertain having those as well. So is that RFP out already? Or? It's not. It's not. We, it's really in the TDC 
hands now, and yeah, we expect it to be out in the near term. Commissioner Ray. Thank you. Good morning, Jorge. Good Thank morning. You. It's great to see your presentation at the, um, was it at the convention center or no, it was the Kravis yeah, Center? Yeah, at the Kravis Center, yes. Yes, it was wonderful. Yes. Um, so Thanks. your RFP, are you looking at um, the expansion of the convention center to go, what, another 100,000 square feet or greater? We are looking for the consultants to tell us what they believe the vision for the future of the convention center campus should be. And within that, we are looking for a, an idea of what size the expansion should be. Many convention centers double their size when they expand because the opportunity is there and you know, doing it piecemeal is a lot more costly. Uh, there is a significant parcel of land behind the convention center that is now surface parking. And there's plenty of parking in the uh, building next door. So uh, that's part of what we're looking to find out from the consultants. Thank you. And just to put it into context, every year I go to the League of Cities conference and it's either in Fort Lauderdale or Orlando. And I've asked why they don't come here. And it's because we don't have enough to accommodate a thousand attendees. So that is just, you know, clear to me that we need to expand. Th that is a perfect example, Commissioner, because a thousand attendee convention is a small convention. I mean, Las Vegas is hosting conventions of 40, 50, 70,000 attendees. And I don't and of think course, anybody sees us being at that level. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> we, we do not want to be Las Vegas. That Thank is you. not what we want to be in the future. <laughs> uh, b believe me. But, but in, the, in the second to third tier city marketplace, the savannas of the world, uh, <coughs> the Long Beach Californias of the world, uh, the Fort Worth, Texas of the world, these are the cities who have really developed a very methodical, thoughtful approach to developing their convention infrastructure and um, have been very successful at capturing a significant portion of the market. And once again, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but between the, the TDC commentaries that we have heard, what our own customers are telling us, uh, they see West Palm Beach proximity to the water, proximity to an airport, proximity to a rail, um, the size, the, the walkability, the, the beauty of the place itself as fundamental and tremendous assets to move forward with such a strategy. So I look forward to engaging with the Commission in the future and keeping you informed of what the RFP, uh, when it comes out, uh, and your, your support would be Thank you. Very well, I, I'm certainly pleased to hear you talk about walkability and that that's one of the things that attracts um, conventioners to a city. Absolutely. They can walk across the street and go to a place like City Place and as City Place is doing their renovations, it's going to be more and more attractive. Um, you know, walk down to the train station, hop on, hop off, go where they need to go. Um, so um, I'm glad that you're talking about that. Cultural assets, the Norton Absolutely. renovation, all of these things. I mean, we, we've taken 15, 17 meeting planners around to showcase the city. Sure. And they say, wow, I mean, wh why haven't we been here before? And they have already, the, the, the participants in our customer advisory board, have already booked 40,000 room nights of meetings into, into West Palm Beach. So that tells you what, what the conviction that they have that this is truly an opportunity down the line. Great. Any other questions for Jorge? Yes. Commissioner Shelf? Thank you, Mayor. Um, just as we're looking at the capacity planning for this, you mentioned there were 678,000 room nights that we missed. Can you speak a little bit to how that's calculated and if there are certain citywide events that, that contribute to that? And then also, as things are moving forward, um, how we're capacity planning for more convention space and how maybe other cities do in that, you know, I think it's great to have more space, but as society changes, like we're seeing in retail, we have these really big spaces. Sure. Do we have an opportunity now to start to plan for that so if convention changes in the future that we have flexible space? Well, there was a lot of talk for many years that, you know, conventions were going to disappear because, you know, of all the telecommunications uh, capabilities and the new technologies that are available, that hasn't happened. The fact of the matter is people still want to meet face-to-face. Face-to-face interaction, what, what are called business events, 
are here to stay. And in fact, the projections into the future are, is that this is a growing industry. It is a huge industry across the country. So uh, to, to your question, we, we, um, we don't handle all of the meetings and events that come into Palm Beach County. The, the Boca Raton Resort, the Breakers, the Old Palm Beach, and all of these pr properties book their own uh, uh, business directly through meeting planner relations. We influence a lot because we are out there in the marketplace and we do book ourselves through our efforts about a quarter of a million room nights every year. So the way we calculate this is that we have uh, instructed our sales team of seven or eight folks to ask the question, why did we lose this piece of business? What is it about your decision-making process that prompted you to choose Phoenix, Arizona, versus what we have? And it's either price, it's either uh, hotel availability, it's either flight availability, all, there's a whole host of reasons. But two that contribute over half of that number are lack of hotel inventory and the configuration of the convention center and the space of the convention center. So yes. We're convinced that those two factors combined, if we address them through a thoughtful process with, with the right consultants, are the way to go to, to grow the business in West Palm. Great. Well, thank you so much for the presentation. We're really happy to have you. Anytime you want to come back, just let thank us know. Thank you very much, Mary. Thank you for thank the great work that you do. Okay, we're now going on to item number two, West Palm Beach Trolley Expansion. Wen Dang. Hi, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So I'm sure this will go well with this last conversation. You know, people coming for conventions can cap on our trolley and get to the Norton or wherever. Actually, absolutely. Um, I was really excited that, um, um, you know, the discussion on walkability and connectivity. Uh -huh. um, it, uh, really good to showcase what we've been working on um, here in the past six months. Um, ultimately, we've um, completed the downtown mobility study, and the recommendations was uh, quite simple. It's expand our trolley network. So so we looked at it uh, with two separate approach. We looked at it from uh, short-term and long-term vision because we know that everything is a, um, we have to work towards in a step process. Um, so we contracted with um, two teams. Um, one team is um, Sam Schwartz, which um, they're going to be um, completed the presentation today is to look at our existing RFP. Right now we have a contract that, um, with an operator and really um, look at some immediate changes that we can um, recommend to enhance our services immediately. Um, the second thing is to reroute. Uh, maybe there are some other markets that uh, we can tap into, like the convention center. How can we connect them to other modes? And um, ultimately, our contract is expiring this coming year. So the last effort is for them to um, recommend and prepare a new RFP for us so that we are ready to go out um, for a new bid. The second part of this um, project is really work with um, the uh, Jerry Walker Associates. They are the um, consultants that work on Palm Tran RPM. Um, I had the pleasure of riding the new routes last week. It's um, very efficient. Uh, Wen's car died and she had to take the bus. I, <laughs> I did. Uh, but you know, you get to experience. All the experience, way to Boca. All the way to Boca. You, ex you get to experience um, some of the complexity maybe and challenges for those who are not able. Uh, so at this time, um, I'd like to turn over to Dan Perkowski. He's an associate with um, Sam Schwartz out of New York City, and he's here to present the rest of the presentation. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Good morning. Mayor. Good morning, Commissioners. Um, so the purpose of this project over the last six to eight months in this presentation is really a culmination of that effort. Uh, we're still working out some of the details uh, in terms of the plan, but I think uh, this presentation is really a culmination of developing a vision for the future of transit and mobility in West Palm Beach and expanding the current popular um, uh, system beyond the confines of downtown to, as Wen said, open it up to new markets, uh, increase mobility across uh, the city, uh, and improve some, uh, some of the equity in terms of transportation access. Uh, and mobility. Uh, so we have uh, a number of recommendations including immediate improvements 
uh, and short-term improvements. These are going to be broken up into things that we can do today, uh, things that we can do in the next year, um, three years, five years, etc. Uh, and then we have also been assisting the city in the decision-making process uh, for what the future of transit in the city of West Palm Beach should look like and then developing that implementation plan. So uh, we've developed a number of immediate short-term uh, improvements, which I think a lot of you have seen already. Uh, these, uh, this is just a sampling, so some of the examples of short-term improvements are just improving the visibility uh, of, trolley, uh, of tro the trolley system, particularly the destination uh, of where these trolleys are going. Um, some, uh, some immediate things that we can do is install electronic destination signs on these trolleys so somebody from afar can see where the trolleys are going, whether it's a yellow line or a green line, for example, um, and improve the accessibility of the system uh, in that respect. Um, we've identified some issues with the current routing. Uh, you know, we've recently ex extended the green line to serve the neighborhood on 3rd Street. Uh, and this extension has proved very popular. The or origin destination pair uh, between 3rd Street and the Publix on Fern is one of the most popular connections on this new system. Unfortunately, uh, that extension has introduced this very long one-way loop uh, that you see from Clematis all the way back to Clematis. Um, so somebody getting, on, somebody getting on at 3rd Street and going to Publix has a relatively short ride but somebody getting on at Publix and going back to 3rd Street would have to ride the system all the way back around to get back to 3rd Street. Uh, additionally, you have a shorter one-way route at Fern. Unfortunately, <coughs> without a major rerouting of the Green Line, uh, there's not much we can do about this loop uh, in the immediate term, but these are some of the issues that we're going to be addressing in the implementation plan for the next couple of years. One way we can uh, we can avoid those challenges and help and have an immediate impact on customer experience and the efficiency is to hire a team of dedicated staff at the city level whose responsibility will be uh, oversight and thinking about planning for this transit system. We've identified three positions uh, that could help. These would be uh, not only dedicated solely to the trolley and transit, but also thinking about mobility in more general terms bike ped connections, improving walkability, some of the things we've already discussed today. Uh, these are some of the, some of the high level uh, responsibilities that these staff members could have. Director of operations would be responsible for reporting directly to the commissioners uh, in forums such as this, monitoring contracts. Uh, mobility coordinator could be someone who is you know, uh, thinking about strategies for continued growth. Uh, and then maybe an operations analysis who's just focused on customer experience, um, looking, making sure that uh, service is being delivered the way it's uh, contracted to be delivered, and then improving the mode share of the city in terms of the number of people who actually use bike, ped, transit, and active transportation as opposed to single occupancy vehicles. So now we're going to get into our recommendations. This is our, uh, our plan for, for the expansion of the system. So. Uh, firstly, the city has committed to the purchase of two new trolley vehicles uh, within the next 12 months. Once that uh, purchase and delivery is completed, we see a real opportunity to use those additional resources to expand and streamline the service uh, that we already have. And these, uh, these, this recommendation actually is in line with what uh, Jorge just presented for the convention center. So, uh, we would increase the in-service vehicles on each of the two trolley routes to three in-service vehicles from the current two. Uh, the yellow line would be streamlined to focus on Clematis, City Place, and a connection to the convention center uh, and the Hilton directly. Uh, this would improve the connectivity between the convention center and City Place, some of the goals that we just heard about in the last presentation. Uh, the green line will be further expanded to the northwest uh, to accommodate the growing demand of the uh, neighborhood in that area, as well as to uh, plan for some future development that's planned in that area. The green line would be streamlined to be more of a, a connectivity, a, a connection for east-west connectivity uh, between the neighborhoods on the northwest, uh, transit connections to the intermodal center, bright line, uh, tri-rail, um, and uh, with connection opportunities to, uh, to the yellow line. Uh, both 
would serve the tent site, which would give uh, future connectivity to uh, uh, that development and uh, palm tran routes that serve the area. And we've also connected both to the campus of Palm Beach Atlantic University. Uh, we met with the uh, staff and student body representatives of uh, PBAU. They were reacted very positively to the, uh, to the concept of having a direct connection. There is 1,100 full-time residents and 3,600 uh, 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 students that uh, are on campus every day. And all have, desi all have expressed a desire for transit connectivity uh, to City Place or to Clematis or to the, uh, to the Tri-Rail and Brightline stations um, that already exist. <clears throat> Moving forward to year three, uh, this gets into some of the recommendations that have been developed by uh, Jarrett Walker. Uh, Jarrett Walker uh, has been more focused on the connections outside of downtown. Uh, this, this recommendation would, in, would involve the uh, purchase of a fleet of vehicles which would be dedicated to providing service between downtown and uh, Palm Beach Lakes and the Palm Beach outlets. Uh, the black line that you see represents service that would be provided at a frequency of seven and a half minutes between downtown and the Palm Beach outlets. And then to avoid the one-way loops that we just uh, kind of touched on, from Palm Beach outlets, we would have two branching services uh, down to Okeechobee, um, which would operate both ways uh, on each of those branches and provide 15-minute service uh, on each of those branches. So there's no plan to go north of there? There is. There is. <laughs> there is. Uh, just... Well, we'll get to that after this, but the... Uh, Selfish question. <laughs> no, no, no. We want to be able to take the trolley. <laughs> no, down. we will, we will. <laughs> um, the the A-line would actually fully uh, replace the need for the green line. Uh, if you notice in the downtown inset on the bottom, it would essentially do the same thing. Again, uh, terminating either at the 10 site or at PBAU campus, uh, providing connections to the yellow line and to Palm Tran routes there. Uh, the goal for this is, to, is for a fleet of fully electric vehicles uh, to comply with the city's goal of sustainable and uh, renewable uh, uh, fuel sources. Uh, and we also have branding opportunities. We're calling this A uh, just because it was easy, but, you know, we could rename them whatever we want in the future. You, have, you missed the blue line. Uh, right, the blue line is the next slide. Okay. Blue line. So if we were able to modernize mm -hmm. both the uh, both, uh, well, if we're able to purchase a fleet for this A-line and modernize the fleet of the yellow line, we now have uh, the ability to reallocate all six of the current in-service vehicles to a new, uh, new efficient uh, blue line service, which would extend all the way to the north to Northwood and then down south to Dreher Park. Um, this service would be uh, provided, uh, this service would be provided at 20 minute frequencies. Uh, it would also satisfy our uh, uh, grant obligations, which would fund some of the purchase of the new trolleys. Um, and uh, it also serves some really uh, uh, needed, uh, uh, a real need. So these are two graphics that were developed by Jarrett Walker Associates. Uh, the left is showing a, a poverty density map within the city of West Palm Beach. Uh, and the right is showing uh, the density of zero car ownership households. Uh, and we see there are pockets of poverty that exist beyond the confines of downtown, which are currently not served by transit. They're actually somewhat um, isolated because of where the tracks are, uh, and there just really isn't very good connection. So uh, this will be serving a direct need uh, for these communities, uh, increasing equitable transit connectivity, and hopefully further, uh, further reducing the need for car ownership and bringing these employees into downtown uh, to work. Uh, this graphic uh, represents the increase in the accessibility to jobs uh, that would uh, occur with the implementation of the Year 3 plan. Um, this analysis is based on, uh, so each of these little hexagons is based on the accessibility to transit within the plan, the connectivity or walkability of each of the hexagons, how easy it is to walk from uh, someone's house to, the tra to transit. And this represents the proportional increase in accessibility to jobs within a 45 minute trip door to door. So we already see uh, a pretty significant impact in just overall accessibility to employment in the city of West Palm Beach. 
year five is where we expand this system even further. So in year five, we would continue to expand our municipal transit fleet. Uh, blue line would be actually split into two lines. Now it's called the B line and the C line. The B line would still uh, go north to Northwood with service about every 15 minutes. And the C line would go south, uh, even further south in the year three plan, uh, past Southern Boulevard, um, all the way to the golf course. Uh, that would provide 15 minute uh, service on the major trunks and that one little uh, uh, split segment between Lake and Dixie would be service every 20 minutes, 30 minutes, excuse me. Uh, these would all uh, also have connection opportunities within the vicinity of the tent site to provide connectivity to the Yellow Line and Palm Tran routes that will be there. Again, this is a further uh, analysis of the accessibility to jobs with the Year 5 plan. Uh, we see the increase in accessibility to the north and south of downtown. Uh, that's the result of this, of this plan. And then we also see just overall increases in the accessibility to transit overall. So again, it's just improving the mode share of, of transit and, and active transportation and alternate transportation to uh, single occupancy vehicles. Um, so we mentioned uh, uh, electric fleet, uh, which is uh, part of the city's goal. This is just a list of the top uh, bus manufacturers of electric buses in the United States uh, and some varying models. You see they range all the way from 22 feet, which would be uh, similar to your trolley system now, all the way up to 60 feet, feet which is not something we're considering, obviously, for this application. <coughs> uh, and in the coming months, we're going to continue to work with the city uh, to try to uh, uh, assist with this decision-making process. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm just really, um, folks have heard me say this, I'm really nervous about talking about a bus-like thing, mm -hmm. um, especially since we had those big blue monsters for a while and, and th they were so unpopular. Right. Um, so we just, I, I really hope that in the future we keep it looking like a trolley and, and feeling like a trolley and, and that it's sort of that quaint, ongoing look. Sure, and there's, and there's, opportunity, <laughs> there's opportunity to, to do both. Um, you know, when we're talking about transit access to areas that may be further removed from downtown, uh, we may want to think about more of a transit purpose vehicle where downtown circulation can still be, uh, you know, something that's within the character of, of the current downtown. Um, and that's I just don't think we need more buses on the road. I mean, you know, we've got buses all over that people don't take. Um, so I think we just have to be careful about what these look like. Sure, sure. Well, I mean, one of the goals of this also is to, you know, right now the Palm Tran routes that we have, uh, some of the challenges are frequency, right? I mean, when can attest to that, that they only run 30 minutes, 45 <laughs> minutes uh, on some of How the routes? How long did it take you, Wayne? An hour and a half. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> So the so part of the uh, part of part of the way that we can attract ridership and ensure that these are successful are uh, providing frequencies that are useful to people uh, that people don't have to plan their entire morning sure. around the schedule of the bus. Yeah. Uh, these are some next steps in terms of where the funding is com coming from. I'm going to turn this back over to Wen to talk about uh, some of these opportunities. Thank you. Thank you. That I I, I love how prescriptive that is. You know, year one do this, year two and three do this. Year, that, that's excellent. Thank you. Um, so we've identified some um, potential funding um, strategies um, because you know, having, um, I guess, a Class A service for our community is um, there's a price tag attached to it. Um, and with each plan um, in the report that you've received already has broken it down. Um, to what year one, year three, and year five essentially is. Um, ultimately, we are looking at excess uh, parking revenue as a primary source. Um, and uh, right now, the CRA is contributing um, towards um, the existing system. Um, there are mobility fees that could be um, used for capital um, costs, the purchases of our new trolleys, which we um, have received a grant already for um, not only the two that we're purchasing now, but the future of a fleet of seven that this um, 
yeah, the CRA actually took the lead on um, getting us that grant a few years ago. Um, ultimately, uh, as part of um, OBD, and we, we're hoping that the expansion of um, the citywide um, zoning changes as there is a transit operation fees that's um, tackled on. So these are some of the um, strategies that we are thinking of. Awesome. Good job. Questions? Ms. Sharon? Thank you. Um, and as somebody who tried to get to the tree lighting on Saturday night and couldn't, <laughs> and went back home because of the, um, the traffic, it was immediately apparent that to participate and enjoy all the things that the city has, um, to be able to get to them easier, I think, is an important. So with that, you're talking about year one, three, and five. Do we have an idea of what the total cost would be to achieve these goals, and then how we could talk about additional ways to get to those goals sooner? Yeah. Um, so year one would not significantly um, change. Right now, I believe our existing um, fees that we're paying for the operator is between 1.2 and 1.26 million dollars. Um, the year five or year three is going to be five million, and year five for us to have to achieve the ultimate goal is eight million dollars. So we're talking about a significant quadrupling our assets. How much of that is a, a one-time cost, and how much is in that's operational costs, that's operating um, costs. Okay. Primarily, uh, we're not too concerned with capital costs okay. because those can be a, um, secured over grant over time. Um, Ninety percent of transit operations is in the actual operations. And, and some transit expert told me once, you can never charge enough to pay for um, a transit. So we've just not talked about, you know, charging anything really. Right now, the planned or the recommendation that we're moving forward that made our system so attractive is because it is uh, free. Absolutely. And setting up, you're absolutely right. Setting up a yeah. charging infrastructure is more costly, and yeah. it doesn't yield the benefit to our citizens. Awesome. Mr. Shelf. Thank you, Mayor, and thanks, Wen, for your presentation. Um, in some of the things that we're looking at and phasing in our plan, if we can look in one of the phases, um, uh, looking at some of the communities to the north, um, the Western Broadway community, the Coleman Park community, and tapping into the assets that are at the very far north of our city, um, the port and the inlet, and getting access to those, understanding this is supposed to be a complementary system to the bus system. Um, if we're looking at this system as a no-fee system versus having to pay to use Palm Tran, if there's a way to come to a, a happy medium in there, maybe with an all-modes pass or something that we can work. You've got a lot of great entities involved and done some great work in looking at where, where routes can go. But if we can look at something to um, further address that and, and provide those benefits, that would be great. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Commissioner Lambert. Thank you for the presentation, Wynn. Um, I had a question about quality control of the pickup times. I know we talked about the frequency, and, um, and I think it was in year one, there was one line that was going to be 10 minutes and one that's 15. Will we, with those new staff roles, or how will we ensure that we're meeting those times? Because what I hear is people saying, hey, I'd be willing to take the trolley, but I waited more than the time that was posted. Right. Um, so right now we have, um, I think the CRA did a really good job at implementing the um, t trolley tracker app that gives us a peace of mind to know when it's coming. Um, the other thing that and, we've... And that's, I mean, that is usable and helpful and it's, r it's right there. You, you can see the little trolley coming. Right. Um, the, uh, and that's why we recommend additional staff because right now our contract is with the city, but there's no really dedicated team that's really managing the contract. Um, so we're looking that part of this implementation plan is taking it back to the city is really to provide quality customer service with additional staff to help us manage um, the operational aspect of it. Thanks. Commissioner Ryan, you had another question? Yep, thank you. To follow up on the cost and looking at your list of funding strategies, not to start a um, conversation about style, but have we looked at discussing advertising in a way that creates a, um, a funding source that is not offensive, obtrusive, or gaudy, but perhaps in a naming rights or um, 
So there are lots of different ways to, to address that, and the question is, have you looked at them? Yeah. We did have discussions on that, um, and um, I believe that would be, um, at this point, it's not part of the recommendations, because I think it's like a big fear that maybe because we see the ads that we see on the existing <laughs> transit system right now, um, that it may not be attractive and um, curtail to our audience, which is, uh, you know, our residents. I think we were looking at a very clean and unique system. And um, so at that, this time, we're not considering advertising, but those discussion has um, come up. And that is a part of um, the solution, I think. Um, thank you for that comment. Um, we'll do some additional research on how much advertising that Palm Tran is actually getting and maybe do some market research uh, within our area and make that comparison and then we'll finalize the report. Just to follow up, because one of the things that I know we've talked about in our meetings is improving our shelters in which people are standing and waiting. And when you tie all of that together, um, you. Obviously, you want to design something that is in character with the city that could create an opportunity to brand the, not only the city but also the system with the bus shelters and naming rights and things of that nature that would bring our community partners into play. Yeah. Great. Commissioner Shove. Thank you. And, and along those lines of, of looking at cost, um, you'll forgive me because I have a business brain and not an engineering brain, so efficiency um, comes second to revenue for me. Um, but is there an opportunity that private partnerships along the way, perhaps to um, get a trolley stop outside of a private organization, could represent a revenue source in that if there's a trolley stop available outside of X building sure. developed in the future, that there would be an opportunity to um, get some revenue from that? I think that's a great uh, recommendation. We'll definitely look into it. Um, the thing with the route is that um, you can have stops along the route. And if the adjacent building is next is on the route, I think that's an opportunity for us to work with them to create, uh, you know, a stop. Yeah, and you know, certainly if um, businesses will incentivize their employees to take the trolley, um, you know, that's another way we can talk with them about what that looks like. And good. Any other questions? Go ahead. So the. The rollout of the one to five years, is that based on we want to get data that we're getting back before we make future decisions and moving forward, or is it really based on budgeting? It's uh, really based on um, budgeting. That uh, we know the one year is. So if is we had $8 million tomorrow, we could do this? Absolutely. Cool. <laughs> All right. <laughs> That's what I was getting at, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm sorry for interrupting, but I just <laughs> like, okay, we got to find $8 million. <laughs> um, thank you so much. It was excellent. And thank you um, for the presentation, for the plan, and for the great ideas. Good job. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, now we're going to move on to alcohol. <laughs> Mr. Green, alcohol package sales on Clematis Street. And Thank you, Madam Anna. Mayor. Rick Green, Development Services Director. As the Commission may be aware, we had been in discussions with 7-Eleven about locating on Clematis Street at the southwest corner of Clematis and Olive. At the same time, we were speaking with CVS about locating at the southwest corner of Dixie and Clematis. Um, we imposed the moratorium. We did some additional research, <clears throat> and Anna Ponte is now going to um, summarize where we are. The 7-Eleven has decided not to move forward on Clematis. Um, the CVS is still in play, and we've been in discussions with them. Um, and I'd like to let Anna kind of walk us through where we Good are. Good morning, Mayor and Commissioners. Um, this is an item that we have been discussing for a while. Um, originally, we have the first discussion in April uh, this year. We're staff um, and the City Commission. We had uh, two applicants um, initiate a discussion. Brian Seymour of Gunster Yogli represented 7-Eleven, and Al Malafaro of Lewis Walkerman and Walker on behalf of the Booth Development Group representing for CVS. Uh, they propose uh, they put a joint application and propose to modify the Chapter 6, that is the Alcoholic Beverage uh, Chapter, 
to allow the sale of beer, wine, and ale for consumption off-premise within the Clematis Waterfront District, which is now uh, prohibited. We have two districts in the downtown where alcohol sells for consumption off-premise is prohibited. One is in Northwest Neighborhood, and the second one is uh, Clematis uh, Waterfront District. The reason for these provisions was basically focused on um, kind of uh, decentivize the location of convenience stores in these two areas of the downtown. The proposal that they presented in April uh, included language that limited uh, the package sales to urban convenience stores and pharmacies with a maximum of 350 square feet of floor space dedicated to the alcohol sales. So um, the two locations in discussion at that time was uh, the um, corner of uh, Clematis and Dixie was the CVS and then the corner of Clematis and Olive was the proposed um, 7-Eleven location. Um, at the time of that presentation, staff was recommending denial and with discussions with the applicant, uh, it was suggested that maybe we needed uh, some time to see uh, how the changes that were recently implemented on Clematis Street will take place and see if uh, the proposed uh, change was still something that uh, the commission and uh, was uh, desired to move forward. So um, at the time it basically was postponed uh, for six months with the intention to bring it back for discussion to the City Commission in October 22nd, 2018. That's why we are here today to try to get feedback from you to see if we put it back in the City Commission agenda. After that, uh, finally 7-Eleven withdrew their application. Uh, they, decide, they decided that they didn't want to wait for this and, um, and withdrew their application. CBS maintained their application and uh, basically submitted, went back to their original, original proposal that included uh, allowing beer, ale, and wine within the Clematis Waterfront District as long as the display area for such commodities limited to 1% of the gross tenant floor area for the retail establishment. They also suggested the individual sales of um, bottles or cans of beer will not be allowed, though this is a requirement that the city cannot really enforce. Um, so. Uh, the six months are, are gone now, and uh, some things have changed, uh, but the staff still has some concerns with the proposed changes. We still believe that um, allowing package sales in general or in, will incentivize uh, convenience type um, uses along Clamadis Street and not destination uses more aligned with the vision of the street. Um, one, one thing that we um, focus on is the vision of the Clamadis Street that is stated in the downtown master plan element. It says that Clamadis Street signifies one of the mayor community spaces for the city and provides us uh, a sense of identity for West Palm Beach. So the location of uses as such as convenience store does not really align with that uh, vision of uh, what it was um, proposed for Clematis Street. Uh, it was also a major concern the identification of Clematis as a late night club district that we have had issues with that in the past. So opening convenience stores and self-packaged sales on Clematis was also like supporting that uh, perspective and we were concerned with that. And also the last one it was um, we wanted to, uh, six months ago, we wanted to wait for the changes that were recently implemented for the opening the first floor uses to other beyond retail that was adopted at uh, the same, actually, there was the same here on April 9th. So that regulation is currently in place. And we also wanted to see the impact of the new streetscape. So uh, those things have been, I mean, the streetscape was just uh, completed, so we have not seen what the impact is. We have not seen if any other of the vacant spaces currently right now, at least on the 300 block, will be filled with the benefit of the streetscape. So we still have some concerns about that. And, um, and also the, uh, the retail requirement that was moved six months ago, we're still waiting to see what, what will be the impact of that. So, um, so at this point, staff position is still uh, very similar. We do not recommend to uh, follow uh, the change or opening the package halls in general for the entire street with all the uses. One alternative that we have been exploring and we wanted to see uh, the uh, hear the uh, feedback from the City Commission was to allow uh, package halls only for pharmacy uses. And the definition of the pharmacies in the, in the code are very specific. So it's retail establishment primarily offering on-site dispensing of prescription drugs and non-prescription uh, drugs, but also allows to sell other goods. So that will um, kind of um, respond to some of the residents' uh, concerns that they want to have certain type of convenient uses in the close proximity to the residential. Um, this will be very specific for pharmacies, so these will not allow a convenience stores to go on Clematis Street because they don't have 
the pharmacy component, so it will be only for pharmacies. So would that also mean that um, um, medical marijuana dispensaries could have also package sales? Um, it could be. I mean, it could be because I think they are considered probably a pharmacy, and I'm looking yes. at the um, legal. We are exploring this. We have not sure. finalized I, yeah, exploration of this, but yeah. it was one of the alternatives uh, for. Um, yeah, that could be. We will have to look into that more detail. Uh, not sure if the medical marijuana dispensers are interested in starting selling beer and wine on their store, um, but but this is one option. So we wanted to just to hear the. Um, City Commission and Mayor um, opinion about this and direction of how do you want us to proceed. And, and this would allow the CVS to move forward with alcohol sales. At it, it would if, if it were treated like a pharmacy. Yes. They could go in that block even though there's a pharmacy there. Yes. Not, not a problem. Okay, questions? Commissioner Ryan? Thank you. Um, so when we looked at this before, it, both 7 Eleven and CVS said that. Um, they would move forward with or without the package sales, but I heard you just say that they want to move forward with this or they would not move forward the, without this. The 7 Eleven is not looking forward to moving forward um, on Clematis Street. They're exploring They're looking other, at other locations. Space, right? Yes, they are. Out, outside of Clematis. Mm -hmm. So, um, if we do not allow, if we continue with no package sales on Clematis Street, would that mean that CVS would change their mind about coming in? Because they had said it didn't, you know, they would come forward one way or the other. I, I believe um, the, the applicant, the Mr. Um, Malafato representing the applicant is here. I, my understanding is the CVS uh, stated that they will move forward with alcohol or with not alcohol. So before we look at this, I'd really love to hear what the restaurants um, have to say about the ability to purchase um, yes, go alcohol on Clematis Street and use and, you know, okay, so you can't enforce the single purchase of a beer, um, but picking up a six pack and walking down to the waterfront and sitting on the dock, sitting in the, you know, the I don't think that's legal. And that's really the question. How do we create a system that prevents all of those negative impacts from happening, as well as allowing the, the, the restaurants that are here to sort of take the lion's share of anybody who wants to come out for a glass of wine or a beer and maintaining Clematis as a unique destination? Um, so I'd like to hear what they have to say. If, I know there's a merchant meeting coming up tomorrow, and maybe that's a good time to see what they have to say. Commissioner Shelf? Um, just a question. There are currently package sales along right. Clematis Street, correct? Correct. Right. There's okay. one liquor store, yes. So there's one liquor store and you can also buy package sales at the Clematis Street newsstand, can you not? Uh -huh. I think the license from the Clematis newsstand was moved to the yeah. um, liquor store on the 300. Okay, block. so it was transferred. Thank you. Can you also, I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. Go ahead. Can you clarify why it's not enforceable to yeah. prohibit single sales? It's uh, my understanding, and I'll ask for uh, legal advice on this, is uh, a state regulation that allows that you uh, to acquire a one APS, li APS license that allows you to basically sell singles, and we cannot enforce uh, a, a restriction on that. Okay. Mayor? Um, and then my, I just want to clarify kind of what the options are here. So the first option is keep as is, prohibit single sales other than what's grandfathered in, Option two is what the applicant's requesting um, as defined by urban convenience stores and have that allowance. And then option three is what you're looking into, having the allowance for only businesses defined as pharmacies. Did I summarize that correctly? I, I think at this point we have two options. Uh, the urban convenience stores was withdraw the application. That was a proposal for the 7-Eleven, so they withdrew their application. So at this point, you can just leave the regulation the way it is, so not allow package sales on the, in the Clematis Waterfront District, or allow an alternative that will be um, opening the applicant, uh, CVS at this point. They will are suggesting just open it for just in general, allow package sales, or another one will be allowed only for pharmacies if we determine that it's legally viable to just restrict it to that use. And this is only for the Clematis Street Waterfront District, so if they wanted to move in on Daytura Street, they could do so and not have this restriction? 
Yes, the Clamaris Waterfront District includes the Clamaris Street, mm -hmm. but also includes the um, south side of Banyan and the north side of Daytura, yeah. so those two. Right. So if they want to move on the south side of Daytura, they could come in right now and there's no restriction in there. Okay, thank you. Uh, Rafael, I was wondering if you wanted to add anything. Can I ask I a question? You. Yeah, go ahead. Can, uh, Anna, can you describe um, what is 1% of the square footage look like? Um, so we will have to calculate basically the depending of the size of the store that it comes and 1% of the interior space will be available for them to put shelves with the uh, self alcohol. So it, dep it will depend what is the size. If the CVS comes across the street, I think they have, what, what is the size of that? 5,000 maybe? It wasn't, it wasn't big. It was a big Do you remember store. what it was? 1% would be how much? For the CVS store? Yes. 125 feet. Okay. So it's basically the shelf space that they will have available to dedicate for that. So, so we'll have to go and like measure and do Okay, so and that's 125-ish floor they can go up yeah. and yes. so it's that's square feet. R roughly yeah. 10 by 10 if you would be okay. 100 square feet. I was wondering, Rafael, if you have any thoughts on this. Thank you, Mayor. Good morning, Rafael Clemente, Downtown Development Authority. Um, and speaking to Commissioner Ryan's comments about the um, concerns of the business community, uh, and this has been discussed quite a bit at length now, um, and the, most of the merchants and restaurateurs are not so much concerned about losing business from uh, consumption on premises versus carry out beverage sales. Uh, the overwhelming concern uh, was with social conditions leading to consumption in the public space, which is not legal right now, unless I believe it's an event space, um, but is very difficult to control. And it does happen. Um, you know, we have, you can buy uh, carryout sales at the market on Clematis, who I will say are very good neighbors and do an, an inc a very good job of And, you know, we were concerned when they, they opened up. We were. And I have not seen any really adverse. They are, they are very good at controlling. Yeah. Uh, Good. to whom they sell when they see it as being mm -hmm. a problem. Publix as well. Um, you can walk in and buy a six-pack or a bottle of wine at Publix and mm -hmm. go anywhere you want with it. Um, I will add that um, Center, uh, Center City Pharmacy, uh, I do believe, has a license to sell, but has yes. not utilized it. Yeah. They've withheld that uh, option. Yeah. Um, overwhelmingly, people have <laughs> expressed a desire for what has been called a full-service pharmacy, as Mr. Malafato and I have talked about, and I'm sure the community has expressed that as well. well and yeah, but, and, and a, a place you know for the people who live downtown to purchase yeah. stuff they need. And uh, the DDA board's only only ask was that this item be workshopped, and it was. Um, and obviously, the decision is with staff and okay. commission. Thank you. Other questions? So, what do you think? I have another question. Do we know how big is the space of the liquor store? Oh. Curious. Do you have any idea what square footage of the liquor store is? I believe it's 5,500. No, the, 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 the liquor store. store. It's, a, it's about uh, 2,500. Okay, Sharon. Thank you. Um, when the liquor store was um, allowed to be to, to go in, I believe it was a combination of a lot of different variances or trade-offs. It was a great deal of work to get them approved for that space, was it not? Because no, it's no, what happens is when they came in, at that time we did not have the restriction and uh, they were able to apply and obtain their business tax license certificate of use. And at that point, we were concerned with the proliferation of uh, convenience stores and pack So at that time is when we suggested to put the restriction. And what year was that? <sighs> That's... Um, uh, no. 2009, no, yeah. 8? Yeah, I, I was on the commission, so it was probably like 8 or 9, 9 or 10, it's around then. And so have your thoughts changed from that time? No. <laughs> I'm still so concerned with the convenience store use because uh, the, I mean, the, the characteristics of a convenience store are very different than a pharmacy or other type of wine store or different uh, like that. I mean, I, every time that I go to a city, I try to go and go to the convenience store in that main street. How does it look? How does it feel? And it's always not a pleasant experience. So 
I still have the same concerns. And, and I, I, I'm concerned that it's a slippery slope. You know, we've opened up the ground floor on Clematis to more businesses, and, and I think we have to be really careful about um, replacing restaurants and retail with storefronts, businesses, I mean. Kisha Thank you. And, and I think I can echo some of those concerns, acknowledging that Clematis Street has changed drastically. And thank you, Mayor, to your leadership for a lot of that. And so we're, we're in a different time than we were previously. But I know coming from Northwood Road, where we have a lot of issues with convenience stores surrounding this very same issue, Absolutely. it does concern me. It sounds like you're on a road to try to find a middle middle ground so that we can make sure that establishments that are benefiting residents are still allowed and still provide those conveniences and so it seems like the direction that you're headed in, in looking at pharmacy is also acknowledging that we're talking about more than just this one application we're talking about the entirety of the Clamata Street waterfront district mm -hmm. so if we keep that in mind I think this is a, a metered approach to, to doing that and making sure that we're we're being cautious about how we're approaching this and, and opening things back up so I think, um, yeah, come to the come to the mic, please. May I comment? Sure. Thank you, um, Mayor, Commissioners Al Malafato for uh, Booz Development and CVS. Just just so we're clear as to what we're asking for, it's just beer and wine sales, so not all alcoholic beverage. Um, and you know, we we propose a limited space, but the alternative language the staff has proposed. Um, of course, we'd be perfectly happy with that because it allows its sale at pharmacy. Um, and, and to be clear, um, CVS is moving forward. We're in for permits. We've, right now, we're, I think, looking at what our impact fees are. We're talking to the county about that. But we have most of our... Tell them you want them to come to us <laughs> so that we can improve the street and make it beautiful again. <laughs> we, we don't want to get in that fight right now, but I understand. Um, but so, and so we're prepared to move forward either way. I mean, there will be a CVS store across the street. Just a question of whether or not we can sell the commodities we sell at our other stores. Thank you. Um, I, I guess what I would suggest at this point is to continue to look at this pharmacy exception to better understand what the unintended consequences might be, like maybe having a dispensary selling beer and wine, which would not. I don't think would be a good thing. Um, and then we could come back and look at that. Commissioner I'm sorry. I was just going to say this is an amendment to the city code, so we would bring it back to the commission, the commission. Once, once we were yeah. ready. Yeah. I, I mean, I think we need to better understand this, and, and uh, I think it would be good to explore it. Um, I do think we have to be careful about this. Commissioner Ryan? Thank you. And I still have concerns that have very little to do with this conversation, but the impact on the downtown and the delivery, the space, the, the alleyway, wanting to do the streetscape in front of the 400 block of Clematis Street, and um, you know how this, I mean, a CVS is a lot of trucks coming in good, with a lot point. of different things and then adding the beer and wine is another delivery distribution place there's not a lot of drop-off and unloading and loading and so moving forward this is going to have an impact and I think that we have to be clear that CVS is a national chain as opposed to the local liquor store who as you mentioned is um, a very good and, and uh, present neighbor to what's going on. They've been on the street for a long time and CVS um, has a national focus and not necessarily the unique street that we've worked so hard for the last 25 years. So any changes on Clematis Street are going to be impactful and so taking all of that in consideration would be very, you know, much part of my concerns. So, so let's keep working on it. Everybody okay with us? continuing to work on this and um, we'll come to a point where we'll have a decision at some point. <laughs> well, hopefully we'll like to get some direction in soon because okay. we've been doing, trying this for a while now. Thank okay. you. Thanks. Thank you, Anna. <coughs> Rick, thanks. Okay, we're now going on to item number four.
Um, CRA investment in the downtown and its effects on taxes citywide. Commissioner Ryan? Tee it up. Tell us what you, you know, it was your issue that you wanted to talk oh, about. We had, it was, it came out of the proposed $80 million CRA bond. And the question was, as we use additional funds to improve whatever the conditions are. I mean, whether we use, uh, you know, money for streets and underground or facilities like maybe even a convention center hotel, what is the impact of that increased value on the downtown? I think it's important that everybody understand where that money goes, how long that money is tied up, because when I talk to communities outside of the downtown, and they see development in the downtown, they see it as a tax revenue that would benefit outside of the city. And so from my request to you was to sort of explain how the tax base is set, what happens with increased expenditures and valuation and where that valuation and where that value goes and how it's contributed to the balance of the city. And I think it would be helpful. I don't think people um, understand how the CRA is funded. So I think it would be really helpful to start by explaining, um, you know, TIF and what and the county's involvement and, and all of that. Um, can Mark, I get Mark or, and Mark or guys come uh, up the table? I'm, I'll I'll t I'll tee it off to start and then I'll kind of Mark and John them to weigh in on it as well. Is my mic on? I don't. Yeah. So the whole purpose of a CRA, from a financial standpoint, is the idea that. Um, you have a you have a less than desirable area that you want to improve the district was set up in a way so that the incremental revenue and when i say that let's say that the tax value when you set up a cra is 10 million dollars 250 million dollars okay. what the what the purpose of a cra is is to take the money from the incremental growth in that value everything over where you start from to where you are today will be reinvested into that district and can be used for improvements and um, to eliminate blight. Um, and I'll let John get into more of the details it's used of that. By, it's used, used by what's defined in your plan. Right. So um, basically the big benefit of that is not only do the city taxes go into that, but also the county taxes. Um, when the CRA was created many, many years ago, we had a very low value. Today that value has gotten so high that the, the city district in itself generates about $35 million a year, 22 roughly from the city and the rest from the county. That all gets to be used to develop and go into improving downtown. And, and that can only be used for the downtown CRA. A Northwood CRA. The Northwood CRA separate. has about almost $4 million a year. But it's it separate because, you know, we, we all, Kelly and I had some. Uh, emails and Facebook posts and stuff this weekend and you know we can't use downtown CRA money for Northwood that's correct yeah. the other thing you can't use it for and John is much better at explaining it than I am it, it, it can't be used for everyday services you can't take part of this the money from downtown and use it for fire service you have to you have to relate it to the improvement of the downtown area uh, above and beyond what you would spend normally so to Commissioner Ryan's point, there is a good point in that, in that $20 million of the city's revenue can't be used to fund basic police services, basic fire services. But the trade-off is by taking that money and the county money and reinvesting it in downtown, theoretically you're increasing the value for everything overall. You're getting more businesses in here, you're getting more tourists in here, and that effect spreads throughout the city. That's kind of a basic background. John, yeah, I, would away. I would suggest that typically downtown areas, and, and, and this is a conversation that's always held by every downtown, uh, is there a difference in downtown and the rest of the city? And the answer is yes, there is. Uh, it, it, the downtown area is the engine that drives the car, and it is a, it is a special area, and it does deserve a, a extra, um, an extra look. And Jeff's absolutely right. Uh, you need to understand that... Uh, that any interference with the with the uh, CRA, uh, we're spending literally fifty cent dollars. I mean, all, virtually half of it, uh, half of the. Uh, what, funding, do you, what do you mean by that? Virtually half the funding comes from the county. Oh, okay. So if the CRA were not in business, 
half of that money, half of that funding, virtually half of it, would go away. It would go back to the county. We would not have access to that at all. So it's a significant uh, improvement. Um, we had a um, we had a, um, uh, a workshop uh, recently, I think Friday or Thursday last week, where we started talking about uh, the kinds of uses for a potential bond, for instance. Um, and we're looking at uh, the proposal is currently right now $65 million of this bond are streetscape improvements, which are improvements that would have to be fun funded by the city were it not for the CRA. And the understanding of how we do that is, as Jeff was alluding, um, uh, CRAs can't fund normal city expenditures. We're not, we're not in the business to create a city. A city exists, you provide policing, you fix the potholes, you run a city. Uh, so CRAs are for taking, uh, as, I'm, as I'm used to saying, uh, we don't take a bad thing and make it good, we take a good thing and make it better. So in this particular instance in the, uh, with the road work, uh, we can't rebuild the undergrounding uh, 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 of your water system and all the rest of that kind of thing, but we can take the, uh, the roadway, which would then, after you fix the underground utilities, when you just go back and resurface the road, the city does that, but we can take it then and make it a streetscaping, and we can improve things like if you want to do things like like bury the utilities, those overhead wires that nobody likes to look at, we can do that. If you want to landscape it and make those kinds of improvements, we can do that. If you want to uh, improve the nature of the um, the, the uh, surfacing of it, if you don't want uh, some, if you want something other than just uh, asphalt or concrete, we can do that. So those improved services obviously come from CRAs. So, so we're, we're making significant improvements to the infrastructure now. So we all hear this, and um, you know, I'd, I'd like to spend a little time addressing it. But we all hear, oh, you're spending tons of money on downtown, and my road's a mess, and you know, Northwood doesn't have, shops are closing, and all this money's going to downtown. H how do you respond to that? By understanding the nature of the statute that set it up. It, uh, obviously, the taxing district was established by state law. Uh, it has certain rules that we have to follow, and those are the rules. Uh, and in effect, the, the, the argument that people don't fully understand is that it costs no more money to live in a CRA than it does outside the CRA. Everybody says, well, gosh, you're spending all this money. Does it cost, am I paying so much more in my taxes because I live within a CRA area? No, you don't. You don't pay a dime extra. It's just how those tax well, receipts are and, repurposed. And you do pay extra if you're in the DDA area. Yes. And that's an additional assessment. Right. Um, but that that's not the CRA. That's not the CRA. And Chris the CRA Allen. is required by statute to only spend those dollars for those approved things in the plan within that district. Uh, so that's that's not an option. We don't have and, the and option. And if we didn't have the CRA, it. we wouldn't have that county money coming in. No. And, and we'd have those. We wouldn't be able to develop those buildings, and you know. In every sense of the word, you're bootstrapping yourself through those dollars collected within that district and virtually doubling your tax receipts. So you're capturing that ad valorem huh. tax that would normally go to the, uh, to the county. Commissioner Ryan? Significant. Thank you. Um, you asked two questions, and um, one was how do you respond to people who ask the question, and you said the answer is to understanding the statute. I don't think that's what the people outside the city really care about is understanding the statute. They care about the I'm fact sure that there are care. potholes and, and sidewalks and other infrastructure that needs to be repaired. And so when you look at a downtown that is the heart of the city, and as it grows, it creates value to the entire city. And as we use those CRA dollars to make those changes, those dollars are captured internally into the downtown and not available to go out into the neighborhoods to address infrastructure, which not only are you know, north and south neighborhoods, but are communities to the west that would like at some point when those infrastructure development bonds are paid off, that the city take responsibility for that infrastructure underneath there. So I'm looking at a long-term strategy that helps us grow our tax base citywide. And to the extent that we continue to use the CRA dollars, we continue to plow those dollars back into the CRA. And so 
the point of this conversation is to look at other ways that the city could, in fact, make those investments in partnership with P3s, um, and that those dollars are not, you know, solely coming from the county that would allow us to raise our downtown valuations in which the entire city gets to benefit. So I think that it's important as we look at continuously reinvesting into the CRA that, that we are sure that these are the only way that we can actually accomplish the overall goal of increasing the value because that value was captured in the downtown and we have to look at ways to increase the revenue because 75 percent of our tax base does come from our neighborhoods and when they see the downtown being invested in understanding that those are CRA dollars may be an explanation but it doesn't help them in understanding how we improve their community. So the other part of that is their property values have gone up 43 percent in the last four years. Their property values and only a small portion of that is due to new construction. So <clears throat> um, it, it's, 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 you're, you're correct. It's about keeping our neighborhoods clean and, and our code, you know, I met with the code enforcement officers a couple of weeks ago and I said, you're part of the reason that that number is 43 percent because we're they're out there making sure that the communities are kept up the way they should be and the homes are kept up the way they should be <clears throat> and the infrastructure is kept up but that's why we went out and had a 40 million dollar bond to look at that that's why the one percent sales tax is brought on 60 million all of those are going to infrastructures outside of the CRA yeah, well, to that point, I mean, that's a good example. So because we had the CRA dollars to do investment in downtown, right. none of the sales tax dollars had to be allocated downtown. So, so while, you know, there are restrictions, that's one way that we deal with that is that we don't have to make those investments with other dollars because the CRA dollars and are And one of the benefits, because that $60 million could have been spread out all over, and a good portion of it might have gone to downtown because of the importance of our downtown, but because of CRA, it's not. Couldn't, you, couldn't, you, say, yeah, couldn't you say the same is true as to the portion of the county money, that extra money that we wouldn't otherwise get, we sure. get to put into investment that would have to come from some other source exactly. but for that extra dollar value, and the return of the investment is the redevelopment of the area that revitalizes, as the mayor said, the whole area that's a benefit to those property values in, in the entire surrounding community. Yeah. And downtown includes a historic Northwest neighborhood. Yes. Exactly, yes. yes. Lambert. Thank you. So you said that the, um, the CRA funding for downtown now is $35 million? Roughly, yes. Yeah, well, this year, uh, thirty-four point two million is mm -hmm. uh, is downtown. What was it when we initiated the CRA? Zero. That's the so whole. So that point. is the increase. You, you only get the only revenue when we, it was, we have it was zero. We created from <laughs> zero thirty-four yeah. million dollars. And uh, how old is the CRA? Eighty-three or four, I think. How old, Mr. Green? <laughs> and my next question is, and so maybe it's in the same Mr. place. Mr. Green, yes, uh, is when does it? Expire. Speak into the mic, Rick. September 46. We did the slum and blight finding, I believe it was 1984. We set up the CRA in 1985 with a base of about 250 million. So that's kind of our, our threshold going by memory. So any increment over that 250 accounts for the 34 million. And it's million. like $3 billion roughly today. And to answer From your question. From the 250? Yeah. And 2046 when we, is when it expires. And when we did that in 84, the reason was Phillips Point had not come online, Northbridge, Flagler Center, City and Trump Plaza. There. Those four projects all came online after we, we set up the slum and blight finding. So the first year, that increment went through the roof. Um, and at the time, City Place was, was a slum, quite frankly. It was, it was a very decayed, vacant, empty area. So. Um, we, we witnessed and we intentionally did that to realize all that growth that we would see after setting up that base in 85. I okay, would so defer. It's a good thing you're here to provide history for us. <laughs> I feel old. <laughs> and I have two follow-up questions around. to that. You, what year did you say, Jeff? Uh, that it 2046, expires? September so 2046. in 2046, yes. is it the intent that then all the funds we've been collecting and redistributing in the CRA would then be able to be used and we'd benefit from it throughout the rest of the city? In 2046, the agency will sunset 
Uh, and at that point in time, you'll have all of the increased tax benefits that you'll be able to use at the city. The, the county funding will, of course, go away. Right. <clears throat> you just and go back to your regular taxing, like, like okay. the rest of the city when the CRA expires. My last question on this is, was the, when was the North uh, Wood CRA created? Rick? Or me. <laughs> <laughs> I think a year or two afterward. I mean, pretty soon afterward. I figure that out. Commissioner Shelf? Thank you. Um, this is a topic that is a hot topic for the Pleasant City Northwood industrial area um, because of the two different CRAs. And I think given um, what CRAs are developed for uh, is to, you know, uplift an area. Um, I'm, I'm in support of the things that the CRA does to take those dollars and use them to make everyone's property values higher. Um, the, the thing that I advocate for is I understand that we're restricted by, by state laws and that um, the CRAs came into development because of, uh, you know, different years. Um, the thing that I would like to see and, and see if we could um, find a mechanism to do is, is to merge the CRAs and to be able to include in there also Coleman Park. Um, you know, obviously not knowing the legalities uh, of things. Um, I'm sure that comes into play. But if the intent is to take blighted areas and uplift them, um, you know, that's one of the things that, that we advocate for the most. And I think um, there, I, I do feel um, some of the strains of, of those dollars being captured in, in different CRAs. And I know that, you know, things have just kind of been this nebulous of time of how we've gotten here. Um, but some of the things that we do, I think, are really important, especially when we're looking at overall city budgeting. Um, dollars being captured in the CRA, um, I think, are allocated for throughout our budgeting process, which is the important part. So knowing, you know, just like you would do any other household budget, knowing that you have money that is earmarked for here. I know we have different grants, et cetera, available in the city, and so we allocate our funds accordingly, and I think the same is done here in the CRA. Um, I get I get a lot of those same phone calls about why are things happening in the downtown and, and the downtown really is the engine and the driver. I just don't want us to forget about the carburetor. So, well, uh, Commissioner, if I could, uh, Commissioner, uh, in in scratching our heads about how we go forward, uh, there there are two things to say about that. The first thing is that Northwood Village is hardly the Northwood Village of 15 years ago. Agreed. Northwood Village 15 years ago, I hear. I've only been here five years, but my understanding is Northwood Village. 15 years ago was uh, was the worst part of Broadway times, a whole large expansion. So not much going on there, much worse conditions. Um, uh, certainly the streetscaping, uh, even though the road may need repaving now, it doesn't look anything like it looked then. So we're, we're still, we've made a significant, um, we made a significant improvement, uh, but certainly weren't able to do all the things that we can do in, in downtown. The second thing is that we look at things um, from a longer term viewpoint typically, and we know we have to deal with tomorrow, but we also try and scratch our heads about 10 and 15 and 20 years from now. Uh, on the 26th of this month, we've got uh, this year's version of the RFP coming back to you for the anchor site. Uh, we've got uh, five, I would say three of the five look like they're decent proposals, but we have five proposals that you'll be looking at and you'll, you'll make a choice of who we'll move forward and, uh, and see how that happens. So there's a, there's a possibility there of the largest increase in taxable value in Northwood yeah. since it's, well, since probably it was built. Uh, and of course, the, the first thing that the CRA did when we took over the administration of this agency five years ago, we were tasked by the mayor to look at the North End. Uh, we had all of that Curry land across the street, and the Curry Carter which was in many hands under absolutely no development whatsoever and, and not, only, not only no development but no possibility of development. There wasn't anybody even, even talking about doing anything over there. Uh, so we went and rewrote, of course, the land development regulations there and uh, since that time, very quickly thereafter, uh, a, uh, Jeff Green, of course, uh, assembled the vast majority of that property but within 18 months of us rewriting that, 60 to $63 million worth of property in that immediate area changed hands because people saw the possibility of something happening there. It hasn't happened with the, with the quickness that we had hoped it would, but we, have, we are confident that we have laid the basis for something to happen there. And the example is the uh, Kazakov building that was just built. Uh, Neil would not have, well, not only he couldn't have built it under the previous regulations, but he wouldn't have built it under that. So he's, uh, we hope, 
the first leaf falling off the tree in the fall, and next time we look, it'll turn around and a lot of stuff will have happened. But it's not happening as quickly as it could. So that's frustrating, and it's, well, and it's very frustrating, of course, to the neighborhood who sees uh, what's going on. I, no, I don't here. think they understand, or I think we need to be clear about what exactly is the role of the CRA. Right. Um, you know, as I said, I met, read this whole Facebook scree about you know the merchants and and you know, all of the, the problems they have, right. and and you know to what extent is it the role of CRA to you know merchants downtown, merchants in Northwood, to what extent is the role of CRA to support those people? Mm -hmm. We've tried a variety of things, obviously, and we're going to keep trying. Uh, the mission here is not to quit. We haven't arrived at a solution for it yet. We've uh, we've vastly improved it from what it used to be, but things like this ebb and flow. Uh, so certainly they've lost a lot of stores. Uh, they've also added a few stores which they didn't mention. We've got a brand new art gallery uh, next to right. next to the Cafe Centro yeah, and some other things. So these things do ebb and flow. If there were a way, we've scratched our heads on how to acquire some of the uh, some of the uh, convenience stores there which we know are Been creating huge that, problems yeah. i mean we've we've worked on that issue for years and it comes down to just money uh, um. Well, and I think just for one follow-up, uh, you know, certainly there ha has been progress, and I think what we all tread on is trying to make sure that we keep that progress. One of the challenges, and, and what I'm trying to express here, is that for the general neighborhood, it's hard to express to them the challenges that you face yes. in looking at the, the limited budget, which you can use within a limited area, which half of it is going to infrastructure money already spent. And um, bond money that we already spent. I think we yeah. had a 10 or $12 million bond Correct. for road improvements. Uh, so a million seven of the four million dollars we generate is a bond payment. Yeah. Sure, and so my point here, I think, is to try to expand that. When you're trying to do a, a lot of need with very limited resources, the, the work that you, you can get done gets diluted amongst a large area, and then you're faced with the challenge of do you choose to do a, a little to a lot or a lot to a little, right. and, and so that becomes the challenge. So what I'm looking for is a way to expand those resources to get to some of the more challenged areas. Mm -hmm. Mr. Green, you, you yeah, wanted I, to say something. I wanted to address your point about, you know, hey, can we just expand the area? Can we merge the um, – as you can probably imagine, as these CRAs have gotten, you know, collected a lots, lots and lots of money, at least from a county standpoint, they're not real keen on <laughs> continuing to fund these. It's – and I'll look at it, John, it's difficult to, if not impossible, to create a new CRA or make the kinds of changes that you have because whatever you want to do requires county approval, and I haven't seen counties – When's the last time a new CRA was created? I can't even think. Gosh, I don't know. They're, um, what, 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 what is it? Was 93. 93. Yeah. <laughs> it was 628 of 93 was the Northwood. Oh, you I'm found it too. That, <laughs> talking about from a state perspective, I mean, you know, we, in, in the 67 counties, there doesn't seem to be a lot of appetite for the creation of them. And in point of fact, some of them are being uh, collapsed, and rightfully so. Some of them have never done, well, and have some never of them functioned. Have done things they shouldn't have done. Yeah, well, they've never functioned, frankly. Some, some have never, uh, the, the small towns that they're in. If you're in a town of 5,000 people and you think that the answer to all your prayers is a CRA, it, it's not. I mean, it takes it takes more than that. We've tried. Uh, you know, we tried. Uh, I've seen cities that Main Street programs are phenomenally successful in, uh, and yet the Main Street program did not take off in uh, in Northwood. So, uh, I can think of 20 reasons why it didn't. But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. It's just time to try something new. So uh, as I've told folks up there repeatedly, we're not the mall manager. Yeah. It's not a mall. We don't own it. We don't own, uh, other than the raw land that we have, we don't own much property there at all. So our ability to influence store owners that don't want to open up consistently, store owners that don't want to stay open when we do special events, store owners that don't play well with others, there have been 100, uh, 100 stores up there, and typically when we've seen some of these merchant meetings, they, you know, typically three to five merchants show up at these things. So uh, invariably and, and, that and creates some, a, I think a, sometimes a, a, an we're issue. our own worst enemies. I mean, I, I'm, I'm sorry I keep referring to this because I, I was angry about it, quite frankly. Um, all over Facebook, people were talking about how horrible Northwood is. Now, what does that do? For someone who's thinking about going to Northwood Road for dinner 
Friday night. And yet in last month's uh, National Geographic, there was an article mentioning Northwood Village is a yeah. great place to go yeah. and, and how popular so, you know, it was. We, so. we, you know, if, if we're sharing that kind of publicity about where we live and about what our, our uh, you know, where our, our business is, how does that promote Northwood Road? And understanding that we have a lot of different dynamics, I think we are on a road forward and, and we have a new merchants association yeah. that's been working closely with the CRA. If we can get some of the basics under control, like security, number one, I think that mm -hmm. we'll be heading in a good direction and lay that yeah. basic foundation. Thank you. Commissioner Ryan. Thank you. I wanted to ask um, Mr. Green a question, uh, Rick, Rick Green, if I could. You mentioned at the beginning of the downtown CRA, some of the projects that came forward were Phillips Point, um, and you mentioned Flagler Center one and two um, Northbridge building and so those came about through increase zoning increase lane use I mean how did because we didn't have the money obviously to start funding a development in those areas what was it that was done that created that kind of high-level investment I think a lot of that was a function of the private market I think we had adopted a city center plan for downtown but more importantly they came in as downtown plan development so the market was ripe um, for that type of development it just so happened that we had four major developments coming in the fourth one was at the time the Barnett Bank building um, by the bridge um, although all four of those received approval were under construction as we were starting to formulate the slum and blight finding report that was needed to do to develop a community redevelopment plan. Um, so we adopted and set up the CRA before they hit the tax roll. And then, of course, the first year they hit, that f first year increment was pretty substantial. And then, as I recall, in the early, mid-2000s, um, when the city finally uh, created some multifamily zoning in the downtown, Sounds, which, yes. right, mm -hmm. it, it created the, the incentive for hotels and mm -hmm for people to live down here. And again, it was no CRA dollars per se that reduced the cost. It was our land use and zoning changes that allowed them to achieve greater returns with higher density or changes in land use. And so I think that- But it, but it was CRA dollars too. A absolutely, I mean, we've given- No, I'm talking about long before, this is like 2001, 2002, 2003, 2004, when the first um, multifamily zoning was, uh, I think it was a strand, was actually the, the, the location. But my, the, the point of my um, comment is that we saw significant increases in value from the investments that the private investment community made and that there are more ways to address that security um, by utilizing things besides the dollars. So looking at the CRA as a designation of blight and slum and wanting to achieve the, the, the ultimate goal, you know, looking at density as opportunities to create more housing in some of these areas that are considered blight and slum, we have a history that shows us that that has attracted private investment that helps increase the valuation. And so when you talk about your strategic financing plan, um, it's about dollars. And in reality, the whole revitalization is a, is a function of both dollars and your land use and zoning and increasing sure. the density. And that's why the, with the redo of the CMUD was so effective. And yeah. why. You're absolutely right. Uh, but it's also, uh, you know, we don't have any illusions that we don't need to have a, a layered approach to everything, and, and you can't buy your way out of every problem, no question. Uh, but that's the reason that we redid BMUD this year, was to increase that zoning, uh, the density, the height restrictions in Northwood Village itself. So NMUD have, been, ha, have already been done uh, now, and we're waiting to see the, uh, the results of that. So we're hoping that- Where are uh, we on BMUD? Uh, BMUD is still in its uh, infancy. We're still drafting the uh, regulations, the new regs on that. We were waiting okay. to pass the in-mud regs, which we've done, I guess, less than six months ago. Yeah. Okay, anything else? A good discussion, thank you. Um, thanks everyone for um, your input. Anything else that we need? Okay, we're adjourned. Thank you.